Laser Burn by Brian Ansel. God rest his soul. We did a brief overview of this rule set in a recent video. Today, we're going to take a look at character generation and you. Gotta warn you, this is an old school set of rules published in 1980. So there's a lot of flipping back and forth and there's a lot of oddities in the way that it's organized, the way information is presented, and indeed in what sorts of things you have to track on the table that we typically don't track in skirmish games. This is the skirmish game. There is a larger version of this rule set, or perhaps I should say a supplement that allows for larger, more mass battles. But we're just going to do a simple fight to get things started. Now, I know some of you guys are hot to trot to find out what's happening next in the, what's the next chapter in the Adventures of the Black Raven. Cobalt 15 has not seen action in a good long while, and I, as much as I want to get them back on the table, I'm concerned that this might be a lethal set of rules, and whatever happens on the tabletop is reflected in that ongoing campaign. So I want to get my feet under myself first. I want to learn these rules. I want to see exactly how deadly this game is before we start chucking our regular boys in. And to that end, we're going to have two groups that are similar. I think the power levels are the same, but... Laser Burn doesn't give you any specific guidance on how to balance encounters. It assumes that you're playing a role-playing game or an ongoing narrative-style miniature war game campaign, and you're not too stressed out about balance in the individual game itself, that the campaign will balance things out. If one side is way strong this time, that may be because they're objectives are difficult to achieve. The smaller side might just need to get to a point and get off the table where the bigger side is starting from further away. They have more objectives to meet. Or it may be an organic scenario where, you know, the, due to the events of the role-playing game, like Traveler, has a very heavy Traveler vibe to it. The scenario itself is not, the scenario design itself, the way it's created, does not lend itself to perfect balance. So let's take a look. Today we're just going to build those two forces, and then in our next video we'll play our first stumble-through game. That's the way Jim Ozarski over at the... Well, he's associated with the Armed Trader Goons. He has a channel where he plays live games on virtual tabletop. Highly recommend you go check him out. Uh, and he does games where he says, look, guys, this is the first time we've played this, so we're going to get some things wrong. We're going to stumble over things. We're going to forget a few things. Going to be a lot of rule book flipping. Now, I'll edit the rule book flipping out for the most part, so you don't have to see my poor book control on a game that only has 40 pages. There's no excuse for poor books, uh, hashtag book control, but we do the best we can. So let's take a look at our first force that we're going to generate, and I'll show you what I've done so far in that vein of I don't want to bore you to death, and then we'll start rolling some dice to fully generate our team. We will start with the forces of the Space Pope. These are 15 millimeter figures. You get them from Pico Armor, of all places, picoarmor.com. They have a limited range of 15 millimeter figures in modern and science fiction. In fact, they have a blister pack that is a dead ringer for the Orlock gangers. There's six of them. They call them the Los Bravos. Los Bravos. These are from their new Vatican line. For our purposes, we're going to call these the forces of the Space Pope. On the far left, we have the Archbishop Acre. Because he, he's carrying, it looks like an AK, no. Where's our Archbishop Acre? He's the guy with the uh, heavy bolt rifle. There we go. See the heavy bolt rifle? This is Bishop Blaster. He has an assault rifle. And then we have a little sub-bishop with a pistol. The three Space Swiss Guards that you see here are armed appropriately enough, with a pistol and a machine pistol, which is different. And then the guy in the very far end is carrying a force pike. We'll have to figure that out. But we'll talk about how to build that within the scope of the laser burn rules right now, as a matter of fact. Now that you've seen the miniatures, let's talk about the stats. The first thing you have to decide is the figure type. Are we talking conscripts, raw recruits, militia? Regular soldiers, elite soldiers, grizzled veterans, hardened space pirates, or heroes. And for the forces of the Space Pope, they're going to be led by a veteran. The other two bishops will be, will be regular soldiers. These are not professional soldiers. And then the Swiss Guards will be classed as elite. They're the guys who are really meant to fight. So we have an odd situation where our boss, the Archbishop, 
is in a way as a vet, well as a grizzled veteran he's actually a little bit better than the elite soldiers so that makes sense there are three stats you have to be aware of and there's two different ways to generate those stat lines the three stats are of course initiative weapon skill which is used for shooting and combat skill which is used for fighting in melee so those are the only three and the way i'm going to do this is i'm just going to write three slashes it'll go initiative because we've got to figure initiative first and then shooting and then combat. That's the order and the turn in which you use those. Parallel construction is your friend. Brian tells us up here in the description what the shooting is, and then the initiative, and then the combat skill, which is a little bit out of order. For those of you that are designing games of your own, just keep that in mind when you present this information, when you design character sheets, that step one should go at the top. We got to figure out initiative step one. So that's why that goes first in our little slash, slash, slash. But I've already taken the time to look up what those weapons are based on the figures. So Archbishop Aker, which he's carrying the AK-47. Here he is, just, just to remind you in case you've forgotten in the last like minute, this is the figure. That focuses as best as these cameras ever do, doesn't it? All right, so with that said, one of the things I want to draw your attention to is we do have to keep track of rounds. Every weapon can be fired either single shot or semi-automatic, which allows you to fire, I think it's two shots, with a penalty for basically the same action point cost as a single shot. The only weapon on the side of the, the Space Pope's forces that can be fired fully automatic is the one of the Swiss Guards has a machine pistol. It can only be fired fully automatic. It shoots five shots every time it shoots. So we have to worry about, oddly enough, we have to worry about ammo in this game. It's almost a light role-playing game in its own right. Nowadays, we have more elegant systems like ammo checks or critical misses result in being out of ammo. Back, it's 1980, we're, we're jumping in our time machine for this one. We are going to be tracking ammo. So with that said, let's take a look at the two different ways that you can generate stats. One is with the standard, and we'll use the standard method for the opposition force, which we'll look at next. For the forces of the Space Pope, we're going to go ahead and use the variable method that's given here in the column to the right. And again, I'm going to generate these, so it's going to go, so for Archbishop Aker, and again, parallel construction is your friend, guys. If you're going to tell me weapon initiative combat, you should present it in the table that way. We're going to do initiative, and then weapon skill, and then combat. So for our veteran boss, the archbishop is a grizzled veteran. We're going to roll 4d6 and add 1. That's going to tell us what our initiative level is. Let me reach up to my shelf here and grab my local game store branded 4d6. And we roll, and the the logo for Other Realms is a 1, so he's going to have an initiative of just 10. He is also going to have a combat skill of, as a grizzled veteran, 2d6 plus 2d6 times 10. So he has a... Oh, that's his combat skill is going to be 50. Oops, I did this in the wrong order. See, this is this is why we do things this way. And then his... Variable weapon skill is going to be 4d6 plus 1 times 10. There we go. That's the kind of roll we were looking for. 17 plus 1 is 18, so his shooty skill will be 180, and then in melee, he's just with a 50. Now we have two regulars that we have to figure out the initiative for, and I'm just going to roll these one at a time. So for regular soldiers, it's 4d6 minus 1. So Bishop Blaster, we take that out. He's got a regular initiative of 8. And for Bishop Pist Pistolier, we're going to take out the 1 that I rolled, and he's going to have an initiative score of 14. For their weapon skill, for regular soldiers, it's going to be 3d6 times 5 for the combat skill, and 4d6 minus 3 times 10. So, as a comparison, the veteran has 4d6 plus 1, the regular soldiers have 4d6 minus 3. And that means we're going to get, uh, this becomes a 1, and we're going to have a 10 for the first. We'll take out the 3, and a 
five, well, it's times 10. So that's actually going to be 100. And the guy with the slug gun is going to have a, fair, a pretty pathetic shooty score of just 50. But his combat score now, on the other hand, we roll 3d6 times 5. And again, by way of comparison, the veteran was 2d6 times 10. So up to 60, this guy's going to be 3d6 times 5. And we get an 11 times 5 is 55. So the guy with the assault rifle is, is a better shooter than a fighter. That's okay. And our, our pistol bishop... Not a great shot, and he also is going to score with an 8. He's just going to have a 40 for his combat skill. So he's he goes first. He's pretty spry, but uh, he's got pretty terrible stats. Now I've got three Swiss guards that I have to roll for. As I said, the one with the slug gun, the one with the machine pistol, and then we're going to have one with a force pike. But we'll figure that out here in a second. Uh, I got to roll three times for it. And these guys are elite soldiers. So in this case, minor edit here to clear up some confusion on my part. We're going to roll for all three initiative. It's going to be slug gun, machine pistol, and then the, the force blade guy. And once again, for the elite soldiers, we are rolling 3d6 plus 2 for each of their initiatives. So 4, 5, so 10 for the slug gun. Five, 7... For, these guys don't have a lot of initiative, do they? And a 12 for the guy with the melee weapon. Now, as far as shooting skill is concerned for elite soldiers, it'll be 3d6 times 6. Ah, doing some math on the fly here. 9 times... Well, that's interesting. So all of these are, you know, 5s and 10s. Now, here we have... Uh, 9 times 6 is going to be 54. So the guy with the slug gun is not... Oh. I did it again. Not your friend. His combat skill is 54, and it's 4d6 minus 1 times 10. Take out the 1. Our shooting skill for this guy is going to be 110, rather. And the, the erase, the, here's one for you engineers. I do have the eraser pen. So 110, the guy with the slug gun is pretty good shooter. The guy with the machine pistol is going to be Elite Soldier 46 minus 1. Take out the 1. 160. So the guy with the machine pistol firing full automatics. And then we might as well go ahead and just roll the 3d6 plus 2 for his combat skill. Uh, 510. So he's got... Two. That's an issue I'm looking at. It's 3d6. I'm sorry. It's 3d6 times 6. So 60 for him. And then for this last guy, his weapon skill is going to be 46 minus 1. So that counts as a 1, 5, 11, and 11 times 10 is 110. We don't care about that. This is where we want a big roll. Elite Soldier, 3d6 plus 2 is going to be... Oh, 3d6 times 6, rather, is going to be 8 times 6 is 48. Now, just to remind you what the scale of these numbers are, in every, every, every case, when you make a skill check, you roll percentile dice and you add these numbers adding in your modifiers, and then you see whether or not you hit. So this is your chance to hit. Can you roll less than 110? Well, yeah, you can if conditions are perfect, but they're never going to be perfect, right? So we're done with the stats, but let's take a look at the equipment. Merely for the sake of completeness, I will point out that Laser Burn includes stats for percentage availability. I'm assuming that that comes into play during a campaign game. It also includes cost, which, again, if you have a campaign game and you've got, like, a neutral referee or somehow credits are factored in, you're robbing the space bank, your space smugglers, your whatever kind of nefarious deeds you're involved with, if you get away with it, if you loot the corpses, you're going to wind up with more cash to upgrade your weapons or buy things that may or may not be available. There's not a whole lot of of guidance given on how to do that other one other than you know just just some couple of brief paragraphs the average wage for a working man is 50 credits per week which means you can buy a laser pistol with two weeks of salary i that seems a little high price to me uh however you can buy a, a an assault rifle for a full week and then some i i mean i, I live in america and that, that, ain't, that ain't sound right to me brother i this should probably be about a third of a week salary if you ask me but again, even for things like ammunition, you have to worry about credits and availability. Some of this stuff, an armor, for example, which we've largely ignored. 
for our forces of the Space Pope, I've just declared, look, they're all wearing flak armor uh, underneath their robes and their, their fancy pants. That makes it simple. When they get hit, there is a 60% chance that they will, that the armor is penetrated. If you are not, if the, if the round does not penetrate the armor, there is a 50% chance that you're going to duck back. To contrast that with the guys we haven't seen yet, they are wearing light armor, and so that means you've got a 40% chance that you get through the armor, and when you, even if you don't, there's only a 20% chance. So not only are you more protected, but you're braver or dumber in, in that you won't be forced to immediately duck back for cover. There are brief rules for vehicles, but I wanted to show you something that I thought was, was kind of amusing. There are multiple levels of swords are very important. We'll see that when we play the game, that swords give you a significant boost in melee combat. However, you can also get, you've got standard swords, monomolecular swords, uh, no power sources required. Oh, that's nice, but you have to sharpen it every six months. All right, it's cheap. And then daggers as well. Now, I'm not going to have, the only guy that has a melee weapon is our guy with a force pike. And up here you can see you've got a thing called a force sword. No chain swords yet. We haven't gotten that far yet. But we also have a power glove, which we've all, I think power fist is how Warhammer 40k refers to these. But they are crazy good. Draw your attention to this. You've got, it's 100 credits. So it, this force sword, that's what we're going to call our, our pike costs uh, about as much as a slug gun, or um, you could buy, uh, let's see, oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong cost. A machine pistol, it costs half of a bolt rifle. And look at this, one lightweight battery is good for 12 blows. Now, I assume that what that means is it's got a contact fuse, that when that pike hits an enemy, bow, it does the damage. If you swing and miss, that's not a blow, that's a swing and a miss. I don't think it's going to matter because I don't think our games are going to last for longer than 12 combat rounds, but we'll track it just in case. The only other thing we need to talk about to round these guys out is skills. And just to warn you, I'm only giving the forces of the Space Pope skills because I think they are badly outclassed. And before we get to that, just again, I want to highlight the weapons and equipment is very similar to what we see in Warhammer 40k. You've got Laser rifles, right? You're the, the classic Astra Militarum LAS gun. You've got uh, auto laser, which is the, the small, I think it's like a LAS. They've got LAS pistols, heavy LAS guns, bolt guns, also known as gyro guns. These weapons fire a spine stabilized rocket powered bolt with an explosive tip. A well placed bolt can blow a man's arm off. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Plastic tipped are available for shipboard use and crowd control. Uh, gunmen and law enforcement officers carry bolt guns. If someone has one of these strapped to his hip, you know he means business. We also have a little thing called slug guns. In Necromunda, we call those sluggers. And these slug throwers are auto rifles, they used to be called, um, and then grenade launchers. And we're going to get into grenade launchers here when we look at the forces of the Unkriegers. But as I said, we really want to look at skills because that's going to round out the forces of the Space Pope. This is our skill table. The asterisks come from the table that we are looking at earlier with the stat levels on them. Elite soldiers roll a d6 on this top line, meaning they have one skill on a 3, 4, 5, and two skills on a 6. So I'm going to roll three times for each of our Swiss guards. They are our elites, after all. And this is the guy with the slug gun. With a result of a 2, he's got no skills. With the machine pistol, with a result of a 6, he's going to have 2. And the guy with the force pike is also going to have 2 skills. For our regulars, the two bishops, they don't get any skills. But our grizzled veteran rolls a d6 on the second line, which you can see, we get to... Is it have, does he have 2 or even 3 skills? So we'll roll for him, and I get a rolling on the chart. 1 skill for the archbishop, and 2 each for the elites. You can buy skills via experience. We see here that uh, disabling, killing, or capturing an enemy nets you 25 experience points. Making the right decision, 20 to 200. What? Defeating an enemy in melee is 10. So, uh, yeah, we're going to need a neutral, impartial referee. For every 100 experience points, they will gain an increase of one initiative level and power. Oh, look at that. They gain an initiative level 
and maybe a new skill. The initiative gain is guaranteed. You have a 50% chance of gaining a new skill. If it's your personal character, and remember, after this first battle, we can pick one miniature to be our personal figure. He's immune to morale checks. Everybody else, it's going to be a random skill. But if it's your personal character, you can pick which skill to choose. Since we're just starting out, and since we've decided that our Space Pope's Enforcers will be random, let's go ahead and roll on the chart to see what skill Archbishop Aker winds up with. With a 55, he has a medical skill. He has gained basic knowledge they're useful to have around, adding two to their throw when attempting to give uh, medical aid. So he's a medic, and that's going to be plus two. I'm going to have to double check the rules. I think when you want to do first aid on a figure who's down or bleeding out, you roll in on a five or six, he's no longer doing so. Our boy is going to do that. He's going to have a plus two on that roll, so it'll be a three up for that. I have two skills for the elite soldier with the machine pistol, and these may be good, they may be bad. He's got survival instincts, and he's got a jetpack. The jetpack skill merely allows him to use a jetpack. We didn't buy him one, the figure doesn't have one, so we'll just ignore that. That means that our machine pistol guy winds up with survival instinct. This is his sixth sense. He's got the spidey tingles. Whenever he is fired at, by someone who's on Overwatch, let's say. There's a 25% chance that he will be aware of the danger and may, when once the firing is declared at him, he can say, whoa, I'm going to stop my movement and I am going to dive into cover. And then you have, that means he can only move an additional five centimeters to get behind cover and the guy firing at him will suffer the appropriate penalties. The last of our guys, the boy with the force pike, he's going to be dealing with 72. He's got a jetpack skill uh, without a jetpack. And with a 91, count last appropriate skill as having been thrown twice. Ah, that stinks. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to re-roll that one because you know, he the, the jetpack skill, by the way, lets you fly a little further. And uh, if you have it twice, you can fire in flight at a half a chance of hitting. All right, but I, I need to give him something. So he also has Survival Instinct. And we'll give him Survival Instinct and Jetpack skills. So if we win the first fight and we decide to give him Jetpacks, we're good. I think we're all done with the Space Pope Enforcers. The Unkriegers are going to be a lot faster because we're not giving them any skills. Honestly, I, I'm not sure that, those, that the Survival Instinct is going to do... Our Space Pope Enforcer is a whole lot of good. I don't know that it balances things, but like I said at the beginning of the video, not every fight is balanced. If you find yourself in a fair fight, you screwed up in the strategic phase of the game. So let's take a look at those guys. We're going to call them the Unkriegers. If you're playing Warhammer 40k and 15mm scale, which I highly recommend, I think these guys are dead ringers for the Death Corps of Krieg. They're only lacking the long great coats, but man, between the helmets and the gas masks, I think they just look fantastic. These guys are from rebelminiatures.com. And right here in the center, this guy with his hand up, he looks like he's about to unveil the bird. We're going to call him Lieutenant Cadia. He is armed with a bolt rifle. So you'll notice right away that our the forces of the Space Pope are carrying slug throwers. These guys are all carrying various versions of the bolt rifle. He's going to be... and, and we'll, So he is going to be rated as a hero... The only other real character we have is Gunnar Katashin. He's carrying a grenade launcher, full-size grenades. This is obviously a shoulder-mounted weapon, so it has some powerful game uh, weapons. We'll, when we get to the actual character building, I'll explain the difference. The other five guys... Oh, I should point out he's rated as a veteran. These other five guys are all going to be... They're just mooks. They're troopers. They're regulars, and they are carrying bolt rifles. The Unkriegers are a little easier to stat up because we're not using the random, and I think this winds up with a better result. We have our one hero who is going to have an initiative of 20. He will act first every turn. He has the highest weapon skill. He shoots at 180, which is good for his bolt rifle, and then he fights in melee at a 100. The best that we have over on the other side of the dial, on the flip side of the record, is a fight skill of 60. So yeah, this guy is pretty badass. The veteran gunner with the missile, the grenade launcher, 
He is a where is he vet, vet, grizzled veteran, 150 for shooting with that missile launcher, 70 to fight. So he's the second best fighter on the table, and then all of our five troopers are going to be fighting at 55. So that's kind of on par in melee with everybody on the other side. But they're shooting at 110, and they're actually a little bit worse than the Swiss Guards at shooting. The only other guy that's anywhere near as good, the best shooters on the table are both our hero and our Archbishop Acre. So let's take a look at that, that weapon skill real quick. Uh, 180 to this 6d6 minus 3. Oh, that gives you a pretty high one. Uh, if we compare that guy to this guy, I would have expected the Grizzled Veteran with 4d6 plus 1 to at least meet or approach. Yeah, it equals the 180. So I guess that makes sense. Uh, however, the hero, if we were doing this, he would be rolling for skills, and he would get, uh, essentially, if we look at the skill table, he would be more than likely to wind up with these six skills. We don't have to worry about any of that. Uh, as I said, they're they're all carrying bolt rifles, that which means they all have 15 rounds, so if they are firing on semi-automatic after seven rounds of shooting, they're, you know, after eight rounds, I guess I should say, they get one last plink, they're going to have to expend some action points to reload. Uh, however, reloading, it says uh, ejecting a spent magazine costs you a third of a move. Uh, fire, But it doesn't say what it costs to... Oh, here we go. Loading a new magazine is two-thirds of a move. Oh, so the math works out. It takes a full turn. You can't move if you want to reload. This is the last guy we have to talk about. Shoulder-mounted grenade launcher. There are three tops types, rather, of like man portable artillery, I guess you would call them. Micro grenades would be in the case of a figure with an underslung single shot grenade launcher. We don't have that. We have a full-on grenade launcher with multiple shots. It's got two tubes, so I'm gonna roll twice on this chart to see what kind of shots are available to our gunner. There are also, the third type is missiles, which are particularly devastating. And we can look at the, the, the templates for those right away. But since our camera's already set up and we're looking at the chart, let's go ahead and roll twice to find out what kind of grenades we have. And see, random selection just for giggles. For we get an 11, which means we're going to have flares. And in the other tube with a 57, we're going to have poison gas. Now again... We do have cost and credits here. We're going to give him three flares. Flares cause a blinding pillar of flame. They're all flash, no bang. If this is within 10 degree arc of facing of an enemy figure when it goes off, 50% chance of being blinded for three moves, dazzled for the rest of the game. It's not, you cannot fire if a burning flare is within your facing arc, that 10 degrees. Meaning everything in a 10 degree arc behind it is no go. You can't shoot at them. It will continue to burn until a 5 or 6 is thrown on a D6. It doesn't say when to throw that. We'll just throw it at the end of every turn. So we have three kind of area denial weapons that we can use with that grenade launcher. I'm not too worried about range at this point. Um, we'll have to look that up here in a little bit, but I do want to take a look at poison gas and bring up speed on that. Gas functions... As smoke grenades, except they do not impair vision. Instead, they produce an insidious gas, which either kills or KOs, according to type. The chance of gas penetrating breathing equipment is as follows. 80%. Effect is immediate. Uh, either kills or KOs. So we're, we're going to be dropping poison gas that will, on an 80% chance, knock out anyone that's in it. We'll call it a knockout gas, just to give these guys a little bit more credit. For not being completely evil, these are, I guess, enforcers and not, um, you know, they're, they're not murderous thugs. We need to figure out what our wind direction is for these grenades because kind of an interesting little mechanic here. You drop your grenade, and we'll put it right here, and every turn you roll a 5 or a 6. On a 5 or a 6, it's blown away. We need to figure out what wind direction is because let's suppose it's to the east as we look at it. If it doesn't blow away, you drop another 3-inch diameter smoke. It starts to spread. And if you don't roll a 5 or a 6, you drop another one. And we may limit that to just 4. So the poison gas will get bigger 
and bigger and bigger. And I think we may even check. I think a typical cotton ball is about three inches. So yeah, I'll pick up some cotton balls before we do our scenario so we can start dropping those out. And that is going to allow a lot more maneuverability. I really think this game is going to be, I think it's going to be pretty slick. I don't think I've ever played a game quite like this. Some interesting mechanics as I look at it. The only other thing I want to cover that I touched on briefly earlier is weapon ranges. You do have classic range bands, point blank, close, medium, long. These are for damage purposes, though. There is a damage chart here. When we check for penetration, this is the check that you get for, for your range bands. And I know you can't read it, but these are the five range bands here. So if we have a machine pistol that is firing at close range, there's no adjustment. At medium range, it's minus 35. It's going to be less likely to penetrate. And then at extreme range, it'll be at 50. And then some of these weapons, all right, I'll, I'll move the camera, fine, fine, fine. So the laser rifles, again, the only thing that's really good at close range is a oh, point blank range. All of these lasers and auto lasers, the heavy lasers, the assault rifle, the slug throwers, they do really well at close range. I think the idea here is these bolt guns the jet-powered projectile hasn't had enough time to build up speed. It's at minus five at point-blank range. And then it starts to run out of gas, I guess? I don't know how you justify that, but it looks interesting. And then here are the effects on armor. So a bolt gun fired at medium range will have no difference on penetration due to the range, but it will have a difference if you're firing at a guy in light armor. He's going to be at plus, it will have a plus 30 to that, did I penetrate the armor roll. Going back to ranges, take a look at this. We don't have range bands, we just deduct per meter. If you're firing a machine pistol for every, in our case, centimeter apart for the two figures, you subtract four from that percentile roll. So remember, you know, if we're shooting at a guy that's, that's 15 centimeters away, we're at minus 60. So I'm at negative seven applied to my weapon skill, which means my bishop pistol guy, you know, he he's going to be at minus seven. He only rolled a 43. That's going to be a miss from me, dog. So we're all done. We've got our, our Unkriegers, I'm calling them, with Lieutenant Cadia and Gunner Katachin. And then the five nameless troopers who are all carrying bolt rifles. We've got some, uh, they're, they're not quite as good, the Space Pope and Forces. We'll just do, I think, a standard meeting engagement. Let's see what happens when we line them up and throw them at each other. As far as morale is concerned, we'll go until the fourth figure is down for the forces of the Space Pope. And the fourth figure, because it's basically 50% plus one, for the uh, Rebel Minis, uh, what do we call them? Unkriegers. Yeah, till next time. I'm praying for you.